The General Airborne Transport XCG-16 was a futuristic-looking aircraft with a unique story and design. Based on the fuselage theories of American engineer Vincent Bernelli, Bolus Sailplanes and Albert Kriz began designing a flying wing glider in 1942 to fulfill an assault glider request issued by the United States Army Air Forces. The prototype eventually evolved into the XCG-16 Airborne Transport, a unique glider that could carry 42 armed soldiers or two heavy howitzers. National Glider Soaring Champion Richard Chichester DuPont worked with the designers to develop the aircraft that the Army wanted. The tragedy struck the program from the start, and a fatal accident in July of 1943 proved decisive. Retrieval Glider System In the years following the end of World War I, aircraft technology advanced rapidly. All major global powers developed an impressive industry around a new age of civilian and military aircraft. The numerous armies of 1917 and 1918 were now dissolved, and the United States armed forces were once again a small yet capable army. But Japan's expansion in the Pacific and Asia, and the rise of fascism in Europe led by Benito Mussolini in Italy and Adolf Hitler in Germany, prompted the United States to invest more in its military. By the time World War II started, the U.S. had accelerated the process of recruiting soldiers and increased its equipment and vehicles in case the country needed to get involved. After the Pearl Harbor attack in 1941, military developments and expenses skyrocketed. By 1942, members of the U.S. Army Air Force's glider program decided it was time to develop a cost-effective glider to carry troopers and heavy cargo into the heat of battle. Gliders already in development were deemed too expensive to be abandoned after operations, and the Army disagreed with such expenses. CG-4A gliders cost about $15,000, and recovery attempts by special aircraft were often dangerous or impossible to achieve. Gliders often landed on uneven terrain or small areas where it was incredibly hard to retrieve them and have them fly again. The U.S. Army and Marine Corps had begun to study the possibilities of aerial retrieval of objects from the ground as far back as the 1920s, proving that it was possible with a straightforward yet effective aerial pickup system. A wire with a weight on its end was trailed behind a de Havilland DH-4 biplane, and as the aircraft flew over a specific zone, the trailing wire engaged a rope loop suspended between two poles, where a leather pouch that contained dispatches was attached. However, a more effective system was required when attempting to pick up gliders. The U.S. Army Air Forces then sought the advice and cooperation of Richard Chichester Dupont, National Glider Soaring Champion and co-founder of All-American Aviation of Wilmington, Delaware, along with Dr. Lytle Adams. Years earlier, DuPont's company had developed a new aerial retrieval pickup system for U.S. Postal Department pouches. And before the outbreak of World War II, DuPont had made a demonstration to U.S. Army Air Corps officers at Wright Field, Ohio. Dr. Adams had invented a retrieval system that was more effective than the one practiced by the Marines, but he had no money to expand his idea. DuPont, who came from a wealthy American lineage, then partnered with him, and the company used Stinson SR-10 monoplanes to pick up Postal Service pouches in rural towns. According to former World War II pilot Leon B. Spencer, quote, All-American Aviation fitted its aircraft with the company's AAS-4 internal cable winch with a braking mechanism. A cable ran through guides to an external boom mounted on the fuselage, and then to a hook at the end of the boom. The system functioned like a fishing rod and reel. Spencer stated that the aircraft would fly low over the pickup zone and hook a nylon loop stretched between two poles 12 feet above the ground. As the hook snagged the loop, the pilot would quickly clam away, dragging the mailbag behind the aircraft. The winch would then use more cable to absorb the inertial energy of the pouch weight. During a 1942 test, a Stinson SR-10C monoplane was able to snatch a 500-pound glider containing dummy pilots and soldiers and DuPont assured Army officials that his company could build a system to pick up heavier gliders. The officers were convinced and issued him a contract. Further tests demonstrated that the SR-10 aircraft could successfully snatch military gliders without any problems. Successfully snatched gliders included the XTG-3 training glider and the Waco XCG-3 troop glider. A Douglas B-23 Dragon bomber was then fitted with DuPont's Model 40 pickup system to test it with more powerful pickup aircraft. The idea was successful, and the Army issued DuPont another contract for developing an improved pickup system 
that could pick up gliders that weighed between 9,000 and 16,000 pounds. This new system was simply called M80, and it also led DuPont to develop tow ropes made of nylon fiber that could stretch between 20 and 30 percent. The iconic Douglas C-47 transports that would carry paratroopers into Normandy and Market Garden were eventually used for the Model 80 glider pickup system. The system worked, but the Army realized it needed a more powerful glider that could carry more men into battle. General Airborne Transport XCG-16 then came into the picture. It was the combat glider of the future. The XCG-16 Combat Glider The XCG-16 was the result of a 1942 Army requirement for a powerful combat glider that could carry up to four tons of cargo, or at least 40 armed men. William Hawley of Bolus Sailplanes began designing this combat glider in February. He then obtained a contract from the Army with the help of his associate, Albert Kriz. The XCG-16 was unique because it ditched the standard single fuselage design of American gliders. The airframe was based on Vincent Brunelli's lifting fuselage theories of the early 1930s. James E. Mrazek described the XCG-16 in his book Fighting Gliders of World War II as, quote, a high-swing cantilever monoplane with twin booms to support the empennage. Unique from an aerodynamic standpoint was the airfoil-shaped fuselage between the booms. The front of the wing on each side of the loading nacelle opened like a jaw, the top swinging about horizontal hinges along the leading edge of the airfoil, the bottom swinging on hinges on the bottom of the fuselage to rest on the ground and form a loading ramp. In addition, the landing gear was retractable, the outer wing panels had slotted wing flaps activated by electrical power, and the pilots sat in tandem. The seats at the rear of the aircraft had little headroom for the last passengers, but it could successfully carry up to 42 or 48 armed men. The combat glider was mostly built out of plywood, with some areas covered by the fabric. It had a wingspan of 91 feet, a length of 48 feet, and an approximate height of 18 feet. Its maximum weight with cargo was 19,580 pounds, and if preferred, the glider could carry 205 mm howitzers, or one 4x4 truck with the gun crew and one howitzer. When it came to flight performance, the maximum speed of the combat glider was 220 miles per hour. With flaps, it could reach up to 120 miles per hour. Testing. Bolus built a half-scale prototype, two flyable gliders, and a static model for additional testing. Flight tests then commenced in July of 1943 at his own facility in Los Angeles, California, where General Airborne Transport Company had established its headquarters. The place was barely large enough to fit the combat glider, but the team managed. As the first prototype was delivered, the director of the Army Glider Program, Lewin Berenger, had passed away. General Hap Arnold replaced him and named Richard DuPont his special assistant to the Army Air Force Chief. DuPont was then tasked with overseeing the Combat Glider Program. On September 11, 1943, DuPont was scheduled to fly the first prototype of the XCG-16. To bring the glider to its full load, bags of sand and other materials were loaded in the cargo bay to simulate carrying 42 men. All the bags were securely lashed. A Lockheed C-60 towed the combat ladder to commence testing, but the bag shifted aft because of turbulence, and there was a lot of instability. The tow release did not work the first time, and when it did, the glider entered a violent flat spin. DuPont was at the controls and tried everything to stabilize the glider, but it was beyond his abilities, and the glider did not recover. All passengers bailed out, but only Bolas survived. DuPont had successfully jumped, but his parachute failed. Other test pilots confirmed that the glider had good flying qualities, but the vision from the cockpit was very poor, and safety equipment almost non-existent. The XCG-16 project would survive for another year, until it was officially cancelled in November of 1944. The glider that could have replaced the C-47 to carry U.S. Army paratroopers into the liberation of Europe turned out a failure. However, DuPont's pickup system would be used to pick up gliders and supplies for the remainder of the war. He was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to watch more historical content about U.S. history and aviation. And tell us in the comments below about your thoughts on the peculiar design of the XCG-16 glider.